In our news media, social network discussions regarding diversity, it has often been focused on gender and race. In contrast, there have been limited attention given to people with disabilities as the world's largest group. Our education focus is on the many dimensions of diversity and disabilities. You know, disability actually has a definition, and I pulled that up. It says a disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Specifically, a qualified individual with a disability is someone who can perform the essential functions of the job with or without reasonable accommodation. Today, if you do not currently have a disability, did you know that you have about a 20% chance of becoming disabled at some point during your work life? People with disabilities cross all racial, gender, educational, social, economic, and organizational lines. This morning, I'd like to set the stage for us with a focused concept on diversity to encompass acceptance and respect. The definition of diversity really means understanding that each individual is unique and recognizing our individual differences. There are many dimensions of diversity. The SIDC's goal is that through these educational forums with our diverse speakers who in the exploration of these differences will provide you with a safe, positive and nurturing environment. See, it's all about community. When we interact and grow, our families, where we live, work, worship, and educate, it's about understanding each other and moving beyond simple tolerance to embracing and celebrating the rich dimensions of diversity contained with each and every one of us. This morning, I'm very excited to bring our first speaker on board. Our first speakers are with Life, Inc. They're already on the stage here. They're gonna review the do's and don'ts of disability etiquette. We have Mr. Neil Ligon. He's the executive director of Life. And he's did a lot to make sure that we have everybody here to go over each segment of this. And I'm excited to hear this. We have Miss Angel Denardi. She was a born Savannah, Georgian. Lived in New Mexico most of her life, but she returned to Savannah in 2015. Angel is an associate director of life and has been with them since the summer of 2019. She's worn many hats, but has a passion for helping people with mobility disabilities gain access to their homes and the community through the modifications such as wheelchair accessible ramps as by raising awareness and advocating for the need for equal access for persons and disabilities in all areas. We also have Ms. Denise Howard. Denise is independent, progressive oriented native of beautiful Savannah. She was born legally blind. She is a Spelman College graduate, loves to travel, serves on many boards, and also taught elementary age children in Chatham County School System. The mentor blind youth in the NFB GMS program. We also have Ms. Rachel Black. She was born in Savannah and raised in Brooklyn, Georgia. She attended Armstrong University and Georgia Southern University to earn degrees in history. She began working for life in 2020 and is now the student for life coordinator. I'd like to turn it over to Lifey. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Denise Howard again, and thank you so much for having us. First, I want to tell you a little bit about life services. Our mission is improving independent living and advancing community change for everyone. Our services are centered around helping individuals with all disabilities to live as independently as they choose to be in the community. Next slide. 
Our services include advocacy, independent living skills training, information and referral, peer support, Training. You can advance this one. Oh. Okay, our services include advocacy, independent living skills training, information and referral, peer support, transition services, including youth transition and nursing home transition, help with assistive technology, and home modifications. If you'd like to find out more information about our services, we have a resource table set up, and please stop by and come and see us. Next slide. So what is disability etiquette, you may ask? Well, disability etiquette is making everyone feel welcome and included, regardless of their disability. As a person with a disability, we are people first who want to be treated as equals and with respect. Our disability is one of many characteristics. So get to know us. Don't talk down to us. Don't talk directly to us. And when in doubt about what to do, don't be afraid to ask. Just relax. And again, when in doubt, ask. Next slide. Words have power. Language changes over time, and some words become outdated. In other words, there are certain words that at one time may be okay to use. This is a list of words to avoid using when referring to people with disabilities. Avoid using words such as handicap, invalid, afflicted, suffers from, retarded, crippled, victim, wheelchair bound, confined to a wheelchair, to name a few. Instead, use words such as person with a disability, person who uses a wheelchair, or wheelchair user. But again, when in doubt, always ask and call a person by their name. Next slide. Next, we're gonna watch a short video. No need to be awkward. Good morning, Bob. Good morning there, big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay, you'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, it might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take my arm? Sure. Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. 
Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't address me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind. May I help you? It does not mean I'm deaf. Just because I'm deaf doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath. Relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi. Would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no thanks, but can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Good morning. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. There's no need to be awkward. Okay. So again, just remember, when in doubt, ask. Relax, we don't bite. This ability is a major part of the human experience. It's the only minority that anyone can join at any time. The longer we live, the more opportunity we have to acquire a disability. Over 61 million people in the United States alone have a disability that impacts their ability to see, hear, walk, communicate, and think. Next slide. And now to give us the 411 on service animals, age of 30. Okay, thank you. Um, so obviously on the screen is an adorable dog, a golden retriever, and as a dog person, my first instinct is to go fall and go over there and pet them. If it's a service animal, don't do that. <laughs> it could be very unsafe for the person for whom the dog is providing services, and it's okay to look, and it's okay to say aw, but beyond that, as the video stated, they don't want to be separated and you don't want to distract the dog. So do speak to the owner or handler rather than the dog when you see a person with a service dog. I saw one the other day that was being trained at the post office and I was impressed. I stood and watched for a little while and everyone around was very respectful. I was kind of, unless they had been prepared for it, they might have already been told don't come up and talk to the dog. But um, it's always good to witness that the dog was doing very well, by the way. Um, don't uh, offer food to a service dog or treat. Some of these things seem a little no-brainer, but you'd be surprised what people do when they don't realize that a working animal is always on the dog. Keep your own dog a distance away from the working dog. And do treat the owner and handler with sensitivity and respect. Asking personal questions about his or her disability is not appropriate. If you get to know the person better or if they offer information, that's a different conversation. But just meeting a person for the first time, um, that's not an appropriate conversation to have. And don't assume that a napping service dog is off duty. They do um, respond to alerts uh, from their handler. So even though they appear to be resting and napping, they're always kind of cued into what's going on around them. If a service dog approaches you without their handler, this is very important, make sure that you seek out their handler because they might be in crisis or the dog could have gotten separated by accident. So that's the one and only time that you can approach the animals if they come to you first. And, and don't assume that service dogs never get to be just dogs, they do. They just play and treats and relax and everything at home uh, when they're out of their work clothes. But when they're in public, they're on the job. 
And we're going to say this throughout the entire presentation because we're only experts for our own uh, experience and everyone will probably give you different guidance based on their lived experience. So we're going to iterate this over and over. When in doubt, ask a person. The next thing I'm going to talk about uh, you can go to the next slide, is the 411 on mobility disabilities. And again, this, this kind of goes without saying, but treat us as you would anyone else. When you see a person using a mobility device, it is often appropriate to give them a little more space if they need to navigate around you. But other than that, they're there for the same reasons you are. And a don't attempt to help without asking first, as we saw in that awesome video, you might be well-meaning but you could cause an accident or you could throw somebody off balance. It's happened to me a couple of times and the well-meaning person felt terrible. So I wouldn't want you to be in that position either. Um, a person's wheelchair or other mobility aid is actually a part of their personal space, should be treated with respect. Don't grab um, a device from them and <laughs> use it to swap by, like the guy did in the video, that's a no-no. Um, and make sure that um, if you're talking to someone in a wheelchair, that you don't hang your bag on it or lean on it. That's their personal space. So if, if they offer, that's one thing. If you're going to be talking to a wheelchair user for a, a good length of time, it's often more appropriate to get a little bit lower so they're not having to look up. Because personally, I've been a wheelchair user a couple of times, and you definitely can get a great video. Be aware when giving directions to a wheelchair user of architectural barriers. If there are stairs or there's no curb cuts or any kind of barrier and you're giving them direction, just kind of give them a heads up. It happens more often than you can imagine. You don't think about it unless you actually put yourself in that position and realize that there's going to be barriers for that person to navigate where you're giving them directions to. Excuse me. Now, as we know, wheelchair accessible ramps and curb cuts that are, we're kind of taking for granted these days when we go to businesses and such, we get out of our park, we're carrying something or wheeling something, we see those curb cuts. And they benefit everyone. And I've seen many times where people have placed items in those spaces, kind of taking for granted, and then it prevents a wheelchair user or person who's used to from using that space. So just make sure that you don't leave your belongings in those spaces. And this is another one. And this, and this is something to think about all the time. And once you do it a few times, you get better at it. When you're going to park somewhere and you're actually parking next to an accessible spot, make sure that you're not encroaching on the striped area because that space is for typically for van accessible spots where a person that gets out on a ramp needs that space for the ramp to come down and for them to navigate around it. If you're parked too close, you'll prevent them from getting in another vehicle, even if you're not technically in their spot. So be mindful of those stripes because they're there for a reason. Um, and the sidewalk as well, this is another one to think about, and this is the one I see quite a bit. People will typically pull their car up over the edge of the sidewalk. Try not to do that because the sidewalk is where wheelchair users and people with other mobility aids need to go to and from the curb cuts. So if your vehicle, your Hitch or whatever is encroaching over the sidewalk, you'll prevent them from using that space. So raise your hand if you've ever done that. Everybody does it. <laughs> you do it by accident usually. Okay, next slide. So uh, wheelchairs, canes, braces, walkers, and other mobility devices are a means of freedom and it allows the person to move about independently. So don't assume that using a mobility aid is a tragedy. It's not, it's a tool. Um, and of course, it's there to assist people to do um, things they want with access, and that includes sports and recreation, just like everyone else. And we'll go to the next slide, and I'll turn it back over to Denise, who's going to give us the 411 on blind and love. This is Denise again, back to present the 411 on interacting with individuals who are blind and low vision. Tip number one, use words instead of gestures when responding to a comment or question. And that's because you can't see you nod your head or shake your head or point. So you always want to respond 
out loud when I hear responding to your question or comment. Identify yourself before speaking so that we know who you are. Address a person by their name or touch them gently on the arm to let them know that you're there. And this also lets them know that you're talking to them as opposed to someone else in the room. So again, touch a person gently on the arm or call them by name. Never grab a person. Offer your arm instead and walk at a normal pace and let them know about any steps or curves to step up or step down. Next, for the 411 on interacting with people who are deaf or hard of hearing is Ms. Rachel Black. Okay, so the 411 on deaf and hard of hearing. My first tip is always talk directly to the person, even if they're using an interpreter. Speak in a clear, normal tone of voice. When speaking to a person who is deaf or hard of hearing, make sure they can see your lips because many rely on lip reading. Tip two, if you need to get a deaf or hard of hearing person's attention, try waving your hand or gently tapping them on the shoulder. Never shout at a person that is deaf or hard of hearing. Look directly at the person and speak expressively. A person with significant hearing loss will rely on facial expressions, gestures, and movements to better understand what you're trying to communicate to them. Remember to always use empathy. Treat a person as you would want to be treated. When in doubt, ask the person. Common deaf and hard of hearing myths. All people with hearing loss are totally or usually deaf and all people with hearing loss can read lips. Next slide, please. So this is the form of one on invisible and non-apparent disabilities. <clears throat> Don't assume that you can't easily see a disability that none exists. Never ask a person you don't know if they have a disability. There are hurtful stigmas around invisible disabilities and it is a personal choice when and where a person chooses to share that information. If a person shares that they have an invisible disability, believe them. There is a large variety of non-apparent non illnesses. A few examples are brain injury, mental behavioral disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, MS, epilepsy, autoimmune, connective tissue, and many, many more. Men, people who can walk or park in accessible parking spots are faking a disability. Men, people with non apparent disabilities never use wheelchairs or other mobility aids. Next slide. So, this is the forum one on speech disability. Do not be tempted to finish the sentence of a person with speech disability, no matter how long it takes the person. Patience is key. Allow the person the time they need to say everything they wish to say. Always look directly at the person you are communicating with. Never pretend to know what the person is saying. Instead, ask the person to repeat or rephrase or offer them pen and paper. Always remember the importance of listening to understand, not just to reply. Never mimic or mock a person for their speech. And you can go to the next slide, and next up we have Neil Lake. All right, good morning. Um, I'm doing 411 on mental health and behavioral health disabilities. It's pretty much the same sort of background, which is everybody's different. Don't make assumptions based on your, your conception and society of how we receive mental health disorders or disabilities. I'm sorry. Um, they are not more likely to be violent. There's a range of personalities, just like the women. It just depends on how their mental health diagnosis impacts them. Um, when the illness is active, the individual may or may not be at risk of harming him or herself or others. Again, you, you have to trust the person who lives with a disability to understand that. That's again where you can always ask. 
treat people with psychiatric disabilities as individuals do not make experiences is on make assumptions based on experiences you have with other people with psychiatric disabilities. That seems to be kind of dry, but if you think about it, just because you've had an interaction with somebody who's six two doesn't mean you know how every single person who's six two is going to react to something. It's the same same thing. Always ask. Always start with a clean slate when you're dealing with somebody. Do not assume people with psychiatric disabilities are not capable of working in a wide variety of jobs that require a wide range of skills and abilities. People have any number of different disabilities in the workforce. Um, I don't know, disabilities are, are one of those. And again, when in doubt, ask the person. Uh, 401 intellectual developmental disabilities. If the person with intellectual or developmental disability is having trouble understanding you, repeat yourself, use plain language, short sentences, and simple concrete words. It's the same thing when you're communicating with anybody else. That's the best way to communicate with them, not saying to the point, not incorrect. If you're speaking to an adult, keep all conversations at an adult level. Individuals can tell if they're being talked not to. Again, think about how you would want to be talked to. If someone tr treats you like you're a child, um, you, you get pretty affected relatively quickly. It's the same for anybody else. Um, treat each person as an individual with talents and abilities deserving of respect and dignity. When in doubt, ask. Next slide. Oh, oh we're good. If you take nothing else away from our presentation, I hope this is it. When in doubt, ask. And, and sometimes the way you ask may be, may be a little bit offensive to the person. Apologize. If, if that's how it turns out, just treat somebody like a human being. They have an entire lifetime of lived experience for whatever duration that they've had their disability to understand their disability. You're encountering it for the first time in, in a very different environment. Just ask them. They'll be able to explain to you what's going on. And they may tell you, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it right now, but I'll, I'll talk. Here's, here's some information. Their job isn't to educate you on all, everything about their disability, but their job is to communicate to you what they need with an interaction. So when you're interacting with somebody, don't feel awkward. Just ask. Let common courtesy and simple respect to govern all interactions. So our final piece is uh, life. Uh, and we've got, the, we have an office in Jessup and we have an office in Savannah. We are in a medical art shop in Plaza, um, right across from Memorial Health in Savannah. And in Jessup, we have a Goodwill building in the back. Um, I guess we have two minutes for questions, or one minute for questions. So you have one question. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity.